Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Rio Yudibe. He's from LA and he is the creative director of Gypsy Sport. And I'm gonna, well, first of all, say hi, Rio. Hi, Rio. <laughs> no, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Okay, that's better. Okay, so uh, Rio and his friend John are here visiting. They were in town for their friend's art installation last night and they're staying at my airbnb and we started chatting and i looked him up on the internet and he's got an interesting story so we're going to talk about that so tell me about gypsy sport what's it all about so gypsy sport is a fashion brand that i started in 2013 and i've always worked in retail and fashion so i, I always wanted to be a fashion designer um but i never went to formal school or education for fashion, so I just started Gypsy Sport on a whim with t-shirts and baseball caps, just customizing stuff that I already owned. Mm -hmm. And little by little, people kept asking where I got it or if they could buy it off of me or like if I could make them one, and it grew slowly. But um, yeah, so it's a unisex fashion brand. We're based in New York and LA. Do you go to New York? Yeah. How often do you go? I go to New York uh, maybe two to three times a year. Okay, what sets your brand apart from the millions of other ones that are out there i think what sets my brand apart is that we cast a lot of models who would never get an opportunity to be in fashion for example disabled or transgendered or uh, short or extremely tall or fat or or albinism people or just any type of person that is never given the opportunity i use my platform to give them the opportunity to model and to feel good about themselves because fashion does the opposite to most of us. Right. What got you started on that journey? I think when I was a kid, I remember telling my mom that I would design clothes for her when I got older because I just wanted to. And, and you didn't like the way she was dressing. <laughs> I didn't like the way <laughs> right. she was dressing. Well, she, she would complain about not being able to find certain things. And I was like, right. when I'm older, I'm going to make it for you. Yeah, I just always wanted to kind of help people. I also was not, I'm not tall, slim, fit, like the usual model-esque type either. So... I'm kind of looking out for my people. So did you make your mother clothes? I made her wedding dress a couple years ago. Did you really? Yeah. How'd that go over? It was so hard. Because <laughs> <laughs> I make like t-shirts, jeans, hoodies, that type of stuff. And she wanted a very specific silhouette, a very specific color, fabric. But I get that from her. She's very specific about what right. she wears and what she likes to wear. So yeah, it was fun. Huh. And what year was that? 2018. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now where did you learn how to sew? or create how'd you learn how to do that uh, i learned how to sew with my grandma i sew by hand i don't sew with machine so you mentioned earlier when we were chatting that you have people seamstresses or what is that what you call them i don't yeah. know and they're so they're working for you so they're doing everything by hand no no they they use the machines okay because i don't know how to sew with machines so they do it you don't i don't but you're their boss <laughs> we're t we're we're a team. Okay, <laughs> there's probably smarter than I am. All right. Well, I, you know, I think one of the tricks of an entrepreneur is knowing when you don't know something and hiring people that know how to do it. Exactly. And that, that's the trick. I actually worked for a multimillionaire entrepreneur in New York wow. uh, years ago, and he he told me that it's like. If you don't know how to do it, just find the best people to do it. Amazing. Best and advice. Because a lot of people, that's where they go wrong. They micromanage everything. I was I was doing that for a while, but also I didn't want to. I just didn't have the money to hire somebody. So until I did, I was fucking everything up. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where, where do you sell your products now? Now we sell mostly online. We have an online store and we also work with uh, Urban Outfitters, um, Opening Ceremony. Uh, these are all like popular stores around America that they're, they're kind of niche, right? But, um, anybody who's into fashion or for, forward fashion knows about these places. And I've been lucky to sell to them. How did you get into your, so you're in stores in New York too. Mm -hmm. How'd you do that? Well, when I was living in New York, I actually had days off where I would, cause I was working while I was starting my brand. So on my days off, I would literally go to stores and pretend I was looking for my brand and say, do you guys carry Gypsy Sport? <laughs> oh, you genius. don't have the new sequin jacket? Oh my God, I need to find it somewhere. So I would make build hype for myself and, and then make them contact me and be like, hey, we want to buy your stuff. So did you do it just yourself or did you have other people go in there doing the same thing? I would try to get as many of my friends to do it with me. Or okay. if they were living in a different city, I'd be like, hey, can you please go to your local whatever store, department store and ask for Gypsy Sport? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, so... So eventually that 
word worked up to someone that orders or it did it worked up to someone who said oh this is interesting let's take a chance on it and it sold for them so they kept coming back but a lot of stores turned me away because they just don't need it or don't want it or i'm just too new so i i got maybe a hundred no's and two yeses out of that but it worked out two yeses is the beginning yeah so tell us more about you how about what's your background what what's the story here i was born in la i come from mexican parents and uh native indigenous uh, heritage and i try to celebrate that with everything i do in, in my job and fashion and stuff i guess i'm the g in lgbtq yeah i'm you guys can't see me but i'm about five seven five eight I'm kind of brown black hair black eyes do you come from a large family i do i have uh four brothers and or four three brothers and a sister but my dad also was a busy guy and he has i have like 12 <laughs> extra siblings that i don't know very well seriously yeah seriously on his side like with his other wives so you mentioned you were making a wedding dress for your mother so i assume that was her at least her second wedding or second marriage mm-hmm Okay, so your first, your father and your original father and a mother are divorced then? Yeah. Okay, and how old were you when that happened? Eight. Eight. Eight years old, yeah. Okay, and you just mentioned you're gay. How, do, how did all of them take that? My dad was actually the one that I was the most scared to tell, and he was the least surprised and also just very relaxed about it. He actually said it before I could come out. He was like, I was like, I need to, t- need to tell you something. And he was like, girls aren't your type, are they? And I was like, no, they're not. And he was like, he's like, that's okay. I already knew. Um, But my mom freaked the hell out, like crying, screaming. You would have thought I'd just like murdered somebody. Like she hates that. I tell the story, but she kicked me out of my house, out of our house. Um, So I ended up living with friends for a while until she came around 17. Okay. And so I was just crashing with friends and trying to figure it out. But I think overall she understood that I wasn't going to, hide my gayness or hide myself from anybody and i think that she came around it took about six months to a year and she finally came around but by that time i already had decided i was moving to new york and we ended up spent like we were apart for 13 years oh wow so did her kicking you out in the wedding dress which came first (laughs) uh she kicked me out first (laughs) okay so then you had some reconciliation then there Oh, no, we're great now. We're super close, and I love my mom. To, she's my most important person in my life, but uh, I think it just was so shocking at the time because I didn't, also didn't want to be gay. I thought I could change myself and be straight just for the sake of my family and for church and for God and stuff, but as much as I tried and prayed for it, it didn't happen, so I just had to commit to myself and be like, okay, this is who you are. Live your fucking life and don't be apologetic about it oh so there's another thread so you come from a religious background yeah talk a little about that well um in the room here is my friend john who i grew up with and he was our pastor's son and my best friend growing up and so my mom the closer my mom got to the church the closer i got to john and the rest of the friends but um we were both definitely queer and we knew it and we were kind of not really uh, accepted by our church and by our friends and family but i think uh i think they even probably thought that i made you gay because <laughs> i came out first uh-huh. and uh yeah it was just really i think that's what made my mom so upset is that she thought i would i would be going to hell and like never be forgiven for being a homo and uh yeah it was really i i, I really don't like or appreciate any organized religions now so you don't go to church every week <laughs> no, I okay. go to the gay church. Oh, you do you? No, I mean the gym. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the gym. Yeah, we call All it right. gay church. All right. So let's go back to your clothing line. So I was doing a little bit of poking around on the internet, and it seems there was a connection to Vogue. What was that all about? Uh, Vogue is obviously a famous fashion magazine, and they, uh, I was awarded an Emerging Designer Award by Vogue and the CFDA in 2016. What is CFDA? CFDA is the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Okay. And so they're pretty much the organization that keeps uh, fashion, the fashion industry going in America with marketing connections and social networks and all that. Okay. Um, so they present this award every year to somebody in America, an American designer. And I was, I, I was, I tried out 
for it. I ad- auditioned and sent my portfolio in and then they called me in for an interview and it was a six month process with 12 other designers involved and I ended up taking home the prize and that totally changed my life. That was a time when I realized I don't need to work for anybody else anymore. I could be my own boss. So that put you on the map kind of? Kind of, yeah. Okay. Did they help promote you? They did. And that's what's kind of the prize is like they give you a, a year of mentorship and help you figure out all the things that you're doing wrong. And then they give you, they, there was a, a financial part of it. They gave us some money. And then we also got uh, like a year of promotion on Vogue magazine. Did all that happen in New York? All of it was in New York, yeah. How did you get hooked up with them? What was the beginning of that? I had a really good friend. I have a good friend named Estelle who was helping with me and working with me for free because she just knew that we could we had potential and so she was like I'm gonna work for you for a year and then (laughs) find a job a real job and uh, while she was working with me she she found this competition called the CFDA Vogue uh, fashion fund and she she actually applied us without me knowing so she's like hey we just got into this competition we're gonna win and I was like what are you talking about I had no I I I, again I was green I didn't really know enough about fashion I just knew I wanted to be a designer so you had photos of your pieces that you had created up to that point i had photos i had a blog um at the time tumblr was very popular and i had all of my work on tumblr and that's how people would discover me and order from me and so i used that as a portfolio for a while until i had official proper photos with models and all of that stuff do you have your own website now or are you on the different platforms or both now i have my own official website that took a while and it was obviously kind of expensive to build but and to maintain but uh that's where most of our income comes through and that's how we connect with our customers so okay and by the way we'll put in the episode notes we'll put some stuff in there so if you're listening to this and you want to see what this is all about you can check it out so Thank you. We'll, we'll add that so what else do you want to talk about uh so we came to palm springs to visit one of our friends art installations um we got to see the big huge marilyn monroe sculpture your artist friend, what is her name? Her name is Gabriela Ruiz. Well, I could never say that name. Gabriela Ruiz. I told you I cannot roll R's <laughs> ever. You can say Ruiz. <laughs> okay. So what was that like? I, I went with you, so it was great, but talk about it. Gabby is an awesome friend of mine who always inspires me, and her work is very confrontational and kind of aggressive. And every time I've gone to see her work, her pieces get bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, this one was something like a funhouse maze like a, a hall of mirrors it was she had a whole room i think to herself right? yeah she had yeah. one whole gallery and it, it just felt so uh fun and at the same time scary to be in her installation uh yeah very inspiring and i hope if you guys ever come to palm springs you get to check it out um but she's from la and she does a lot of shows in la too do you know how long that installation will be up i think did it's she, three, mo- she three months oh it is yeah so they kind of mentored her and gave her a space and a place just like vogue did for you then actually yeah very true uh-huh. yeah it was kind of wild because i as i said i went with rio and john to to the art installation at the uh the art museum in palm springs and it was it was so funny because it reminded me of seattle so much and i i kept saying this is not a Palm Springs crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the outfits and the people and the wild hairdos. And, I mean, it was so creative. Everybody's walking around like these little creations walking around. It was, it was great. It's cool. But it, it uh, reminded me a lot of kind of the art scene in Seattle. It was very cool. Reminiscing about that. Yeah, it was a fun crowd for sure. So where do you go from here for you personally? Uh, from from Palm Springs, I'm going back no, to no, LA. no, no, no. I mean your your business, all your oh. work. What's gonna What's gonna happen here? Oh, so uh, what we do to keep going is every year we put on a fashion show. Okay. And um, it, it used to be part of New York Fashion Week, but since I moved back to LA, now it's part of LA Fashion Week, okay. and that's coming up in October this this year. And so that show usually that's the way that we show our show my designs to the world, get orders from people, and. Uh, book models and you know do the whole fashion thing and that kind of carries us through a whole year we sell that collection through a whole year and then every October we'll show a new collection and then sell that for a year and try to get more stores and when is that again October 8th am I invited absolutely I'll come come. if I'm in town or in the area well I'm not in town in LA but if I'm in Southern California I'll definitely come yeah I'd like to see that yeah please do it's super fun so I was reading online that was originally scheduled when 
that was scared. Well, my when I moved to LA, it was right before COVID happened and i had a the reason i moved to la is because this company reached out to me and said we want to produce your fashion show but we want you to do it in la and on this is the time that it needs to happen so i said i'm down i'm game let's go for it and i kind of booked an entire my entire move around it i was like i think la is the next place for me to go and to continue doing fashion and and uh yeah i moved i moved to la ready for the show had a whole collection ready and then obviously the pandemic hit so we had to delay this for two years wow yeah so how did that feel it felt super uh i don't like what's the word um like just shitty <laughs> like <laughs> deflated uh shitty there's the word, there's okay. the word. <laughs> it's like you said you save up so much money and and you put all your time and energy into like making this thing happen and you spend everything you've got and then suddenly they tell you hey we're actually gonna have to postpone it for a few months and then that few months turns into a year and then that year turns into another year and so you're just waiting for your chance to like show show people your stuff and so yeah we're finally gonna do it october 8th cool and I remember reading one of your disappointments was the disappointment you felt for your models yeah, when, that, when that got canceled. So talk about that. Well, I'm very close with a lot of my models and the people that I work with around gypsy sport and, and in fashion. They're usually friends or family of mine. And so um, a lot of them were a lot of times people get their first big break on my show um, in my fashion shows. And then they go on to have great fashion careers in modeling or music production or whatever they do with me. And so this was a big opportunity for me as much as it was for them. And so when I had to say no to them, that means I'm not able to pay them for the walk in the runway or they're not able to get their picture on Vogue or they're not able to like, you know, show off on the runway like they want to. So I was, I was bummed for them as much as I was for myself. Are you, did you, were you able to reschedule most of the same models or not? It's half of them. A lot, some people moved away. I think COVID just changed everyone's life. Some people just, decided they don't want to be models anymore but this whole new batch of of people came through to our casting we hold we hold these open castings all ages all body types all sizes all genders are welcome to come and it's kind of like a big huge party where you meet it's kind of like the, our, our event last night like where you just meet so many different types of people and um it's usually about 100 to 200 people and i have to narrow that down to like 30 and but that's super fun and the hardest part is just telling people sorry you didn't make the cut but try out again next year and let's keep keep talking keep in touch mm. um but the casting parties are super fun and that's how we find all, all of our models and then once they get on the runway it's like that's the, the ultimate goal for them so i would assume you have to size the clothing and match the clothing type to the person that you're choosing is that right that's right so what's the process i'm putting on a show i'm curious i've never put on a fashion show how do you do it it usually starts with a location, a venue, and once once I have that, uh, that inspires the rest of the show. Where will this one be, the October 8th one? October 8th, we're taking over. It's a place that used to be called Amoeba in, in uh, Hollywood, and it okay. was a huge popular record store. Now it's completely gutted, renovated, and it's just kind of a big white space, but we're going to do some really cool uh, projections on the walls and turn the dress up the space a lot. Uh, but last year we had it at the Peterson Auto Museum in in downtown LA, and such an amazing venue. It's a pretty new building, um, but it's a car museum. So they had everything from the Batmobile to like the Knight Rider car <laughs> to like modern, cool new stuff that hasn't even been hit the road yet. And so we got to take over their rooftop and have a show up there. And so is, wait, did you actually do that show, or was that the one that was postponed? That was the one that was postponed, but we did it last year. Oh, you so you, this is your second show since COVID? in LA? Yes, gotcha. Show. Okay, yeah. cool. I misunderstood that. Okay, oh. so what else do you do to put on a show like that? So you make a bunch of clothes, and and on your last point that you mentioned, like I I actually make things in lots of different sizes so that I can cast people of different sizes and stuff because. I used to do it the wrong way before where I would make everything sample size. And then I'm like, oh, I want to use plus size models or like shorter people. And I couldn't do it because all the samples were traditional size. Uh, right. But now we just make things in all different sizes and colors and it works out. So you just choose what you want. Yeah, because let's say I make like a, a blue dress. When I'm casting, I'm looking for the girl or, bo or boy or person that's going to wear the blue dress because I know I need somebody with this specific height or body type or skin tone. Right. Um, so I kind of cast in reverse like a cast to fit into my work and it's fun what's one of the hardest things you've encountered 
doing this whole business? The hardest thing I I've encountered is uh, losing, making and losing friends with because of business. Like working with your friends is super fun, but also when money's involved and payments and bills and all that, it can get a little tricky. And especially for an entrepreneur who doesn't have any like professional experience um, being a boss, I have lost some friends because they just didn't enjoy working for me or they just wanted to get paid more or they've found better opportunities somewhere else. And uh, yeah, just it, I think it business changes friendship sometimes and I've lost some friends, but you meet a lot of people you some you meet a lot of like awesome friends along the way too so what's one of your couple of your favorite things about doing this i love i love just making people feel good and i like when people try things on and they're like very happy to be wearing it or if they if they're not i know right away that they can't like i need to change them and like put them in something else but <laughs> right. i just like making people feel good in, in in my clothes so when you choose your models and then you choose the clothes they're going to wear do you ever run into it where they go hmm I don't yep. like this all the time. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And you go too bad. Wear it if you want to be in the show or what? Oh no, 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 no. I'll <laughs> I'll say like, okay, we can try to find something else for you, or yeah, you can't walk because this is the only look we have left. But um, it doesn't so happen the, often. The, so the last look on your on your list, they better like it, right? Exactly. <laughs> you better like it, or you're you're off. You're chopped. Huh. No, I actually uh, I usually go into every fitting with my question first is like are there any body parts you don't want to show or is there any part of your body you want to celebrate or is there anything that you absolutely will not wear so i won't even put them in something until i know that they're comfortable because if you don't like what you're wearing you're not going to sell it on the runway you're going to come off kind of shy or like insecure right. and that's not and our 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 whole like if you ever watch our fashion shows it's all about joy it's all about confidence it's all about like exuberance and you need you, that's what sells the garments and that's what sells the brand so right yeah that's funny you bring that up because i've looked at i don't watch a lot of fashion stuff but i've seen some runway things and i'm looking at what they're wearing and and my first question to myself is i wonder how the model feels wearing that because they look so ridiculous <laughs> yeah. how, do, how do they feel about that like they're wearing some <laughs> giant box on their head or something i mean some you know some of the far out stuff yeah that's really crazy it is fashion is a funny thing so I was, I got into a deal where I got some free magazines and I would never buy it, but I, I got a couple that, uh, I even forget what they were. Might have, uh, it wasn't S might've been Esquire. I don't know, but s some of the, the latest fashion stuff in there is really crazy. Yeah. And do you look, I mean, you must look at some of that, right? I do. Why, why do they do that? I mean, it's like, who is going to wear some of this stuff? Okay. It's so over the top. What's the point? <laughs> First it's of all, Wilkinson, we'll be... you're talking about me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not. No, I, I, I think we do that. A lot of designers, We it's such a competitive industry, and I think we do stupid things just to stand out. But sometimes, for example, what uh, one of the tricks that fashion designers use is you'll put a box on one model's head, just to get the press talking about it. But the second look after that model will be an actual sellable look that will make you money. So just getting attention to your collection is all is, is what it's all about. Oh, like did, when, I, did I offend you? Did you, do you have a box on somebody's head? On no, <laughs> no, but I'm going to do it on the next run. Right now. Oh, there you go. Wow. Well, if you want to, well, I could actually be one of your models if you want to cover me in boxes <laughs> so they don't see me. <laughs> <laughs> could we work something like that out? Everyone's going to say, who's the man in the box? Well, yeah, that could be. Yeah. Maybe it's a thing. It is. It's not a bad idea. I mean, you'll, I... walk, you'll walk down the street in LA and everyone will be wearing boxes all over their bodies. <laughs> we'll know where they got it from. <laughs> where do you see yourself in 10 years? Uh, so I'm at the point right now where I want to start owning property and um, buying homes for, well, first for myself and my mom and then uh, hopefully, if my brothers need the help, I would love to give them homes. And uh, the brand is doing very well, so I imagine that we'll be growing and probably open a big office or studio in L.A. in the next couple of years that just hire more people. I come from a pretty low-income immigration background, immigrant family background, so I, I want to just break the like generational chains of poverty and leave a legacy for my nieces, nephews, grandchildren, and whoever comes after me. Any final thoughts or something you want to share with the audience here? What, do you have anything you want to tell them? 
uh, if you guys come to Palm Springs and Wilkinson has not sold this place, you should definitely check it out. It's a beautiful home with an amazing yard and just Wilkinson's a pretty awesome guy to hang out with. And uh, if you're in LA on October 8th, come to my fashion show. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But other than that, um, thanks guys for listening. Love yourself and have a good day. It's been great having you. Thanks for letting me talk you into doing this. <laughs> I had to do a little bit of salesman on you, but it was good. I think it was fun. So thank you. Thank you.